Oh, what has he done now? He's been buying junk off eBay again, hasn't he? Oh my goodness me. I think this might be my crowning achievement. I've bought some strange stuff off eBay. Some people would question my money management. Last month I even found a genuine bog roll from an old telephone exchange in the 1960s, I'm guessing, and they actually stamped property of the general post office on it. I guess the engineers were nicking it, but I don't know why, because it's like greaseproof paper. I don't think you would want to wipe your bum with that. And this is probably an even more bonkers buy. As you can see, it's in pretty bad repair, but one man's trash is another's treasure. This is an old fashioned telephone switchboard from around the 1930s, back when you had to call the operator. And this is what they operated. Clear. Mr. Bell, please. Alexander. Certainly. Patching you through now. Ahoy, hoy. Operators would be wearing a headset like this. I've heard that it was possible for the operators to actually listen in on the conversations. Strictly forbidden, of course, but handy if you want some of the local gossip. Those photos were out of a series of pamphlets, the post office engineering department's technical pamphlets for workmen. And I've got a whole collection of them that came from one engineer, G.E. Ross. Quite amazing things to look through. They've got annotations and little stuck in addendums. Some of them date back to 1919. And I've put scans up on the Patreon. These manual switchboard systems were in use before the advent of automatic exchanges. Uh, Almond Strouger, the man who invented the electromechanical switches used in the step-by-step -step exchanges, was working as an undertaker and the wife of his biggest competitor worked as a telephone operator and whenever someone phoned in asking for an undertaker she would naturally connect them to her husband and so Strouger was losing all of his business and he was so annoyed that he invented the automatic telephone exchange. So I got this for 20 quid, and even though it's seen better days, I'm pretty sure we can still get some value out of it. And not to be underestimated, it's just the joy that I get from having this bonkers thing next to me in my workshop. And because it's in such a bad state, I don't actually feel bad about dismantling it for parts. Some things are way beyond saving, but actually there's a fair bit that we can get from this. First of all, miles of wire. Now, wire's not the most exciting thing, but I use loads of it, and often it's on show, like in my Uniselector sequencer, and this is really nice old school wiring with all kinds of different colours and striping, and it's actually not so simple finding this stuff for cheap. It's gonna get recycled into all kinds of projects, so keep an eye out for that. Just the wire alone, honestly, is probably worth the 20 quid. We've got a ton of relays, and you know, I love clicky relays. You can click up here to see my clicky relay module demo. We have a magneto. You put a lever in there, turn it, and that generates the electricity needed to ring the telephone bell at the end of the line. Very cool, and we've actually got a bell. And I've seen these go on eBay for 20 quid alone. There's a General Electric Company 300 ohm resistor. This is more like a Beretta, just like a light bulb really. The tube is filled with hydrogen gas and there's an iron wire for it, just like the filament in a bulb. And as electricity flows through the wire, it heats it up and that increases its resistance. So it can self-regulate the current passing through it, stabilizing the effect of fluctuating supply voltages and it's completely passive very clever we also have a patch bay i'm unsure if this can be restored to any kind of practical use but it would be really cool to use it in a music studio after all that idea of using a patch bay in a music studio came from telephone exchanges patch bays and jack cables were invented for telephone exchanges and that's why studio patch bays use bantam jacks because these switchboards used Phantom jacks. So how cool would that be to get it working in a music studio? We're not going to waste anything. I've even got an idea how to use the wood. We've even got a plethora of free cobwebs and even a wasp's nest in here. Fantastic value for money, but I've saved the best till last. Right here we have 50 doll's eye indicators and those are what we're going to take a look at today.
These are mounted in a row. So let's pull one out and have a look at it. So here it is. Here's a row of doll's eye indicators. They're a bit dusty, but this one I spent about two seconds cleaning up with a toothbrush. Looks all right. They're very simple, so there can't be much that could go wrong with them. A little bit of WD-40 can fix anything. This one's got a bit of a problem. It's taken a dent at some point, so I'm gonna take that all apart and fix it up and do a video for Patreon members uh, showing exactly how these work. So now if I hook up number three to some power you can see exactly what the doll's eye indicators do. And you can see why they call them doll's eye indicators. Now I've got the power routed through my 1606 electromagnetic switch module and when I press the button it switches the indicator. But you don't have to switch this module by hand, you can send in an LFO. Okay, so I'm going to go away now and fix up all of these indicators so that we can do some awesome stuff with them next time. That video of me taking these apart, fixing them, mending them, maintaining them is going to be available just for Patreon members. We're going to go deep dive into these. And if you're watching this video just as it's come out, I'm doing a module giveaway. So come and sign up and you'll be automatically entered into that. And remember the scans from the Workman's pamphlets, they're on there as well. I design all kinds of synth modules and DIY electronics tools so check out the shop links below right i better get on with this i will see you in the next one